nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. Um, and, and where I'll go next is the sample. So a way to think about this is we've talked now about most of the mechanics of the TEM, right? We've talked about how to get electrons. We've talked about how to use lenses to control the behavior of the electrons um, throughout the system. We've talked about uh, uh, vacuum. We've talked about uh, measuring vacuum. We've talked about how the instrument all goes together. You're starting to work in the lab to make all these things reality. Oh, we talked about electron detection, right? Because, of course, you need to see the electrons. Now, the final thing in terms of just the mechanics of things is the sample, right? Um, you need to look at something. Now, sample preparation is uh, a very unique thing to each type of sample you are looking at. I could have a semester-long class on TEM sample preparation. And if I did so, each of you would be interested in two lectures of it, right? And the rest of it would probably not be relevant for you because it wouldn't pertain to your type of sample preparation, OK? So I have chosen in this short period to instead overview all of the sample preparation types that are out there, give you an insight into how they each work, into which types of sample preparation are appropriate for which types of samples. And that's about where I'll quit, OK? My expectation is that most of you all will uh, do one of two things. You'll either be yet another graduate student in your group that is using the TEM and a more senior graduate student can help you with your sample preparation. That's the hope. The other one is that if you have, if you're the first person doing this, then you talk to me individually and I help you. Um, or I refer you to someone who can help you. And that means two or three years from now, don't be surprised to get an email from some students saying, oh, Professor Stack said that you know how to do electropolishing. And at that point, it's time for you to pay back um, and help me by training that as well. OK, because it's just really you have to get a hands on feel for each of these techniques, develop some skill on them, and then pass them on. So don't be surprised if at some point you know, I say to Jeremy, you're the fib guy now, right? I need to have a couple of people using the focused ion beam. Um, so can you help me with a little bit of the, of the, uh, of the use of that? Um, so what I want to do is go through the different techniques. Um, the overview of this lecture is first I'll start off with safety. Um, there are a number of extremely dangerous and nasty chemicals that make extremely good TEM samples. Okay, And so I want to talk about safety um, and emphasize some points. The primary thing about the TEM sample is that you need it to be extremely thin because, of course, this is a transmission electron microscope. If your sample is thick, no electrons make it through the other side. More importantly, if you want to do the highest levels of resolution for imaging and for spectroscopy, the sample needs to be extremely thin in order to do that well. Then I'll go through and talk about the different laboratory methods, just several of them, um, finishing up with a, a, a brief insight into the focused ion beam, a new tool um, that you can use for this that is helpful to solve some of the problems that other techniques cannot. Okay, safety. Okay, I'm not doing this uh, just because I, I feel like I need to cover my behind. Um, you know, I think this is very important. We have lots of nasty chemicals, and I want to emphasize to you that as you start to do your work, you need to be aware of the particular safety issues associated with what you do. Um, some of the chemicals that we use are particularly dangerous. Aluminum, it's an important metal, right? It's one that's ubiquitously used in technology. The single best way to make aluminum samples is using electropolishing with perchloric acid. Okay? Perchloric acid goes boom, all right? um, and it can blow up. So when you use perchloric acid, you need to use it in a fume hood that has running water in the back. I believe there is one on campus. I've yet to be asked by anyone to use it, but you should be aware of the fact that if you read a recipe for making samples out of aluminum and it says, you know, mix perchloric and methanol, it's assuming that you know how dangerous that is. Okay? So don't do that unless you see me. Period. 
Okay? Similarly, the single best way to make samples out of silicon, moderately important material in our world, um, is to use hydrofluoric acid, often combined with acetic and nitric acid. Hydrofluoric acid, what happens is the acetic or the nitric, I think it's actually the nitric, will convert silicon into silicon dioxide. The hydrofluoric etches the silicon dioxide, and you can use that to gradually thin your sample. Hydrofluoric can kill you if you have too large of an exposure. Even a very small exposure will cause extremely damaging, permanently damaging burns to you and can cause really, really big problems. If you are going to use hydrofluoric acid, see me, okay? Just let me go through that procedure with you. I've used it several thousand times in my life. My PhD work was on silicon. I make very good silicon samples using hydrofluoric acid, nitric, and acetic. But you need to be careful. You need to have proper gear, the right type of gloves, not just any old gloves, a particular type of rubber glove, okay? You need to have your face covered. You need to make sure that you're using a plastic shield. You do not want to get this stuff on you at all. Um, I have had two periods where I've gone to the hospital myself just out of general concern. Um, fortunately, in each case, no problem. Um, it's important that if you have an exposure to hydrofluoric acid, you do two things first. First, you rinse that area in cold water. Second, you use calcium glauconate gel or depending on your lab, there's another newer gel that the Burks facility uh, likes better, but you will need to have that gel in your lab before you touch hydrofluoric, before you bring it into the lab, okay? So you wash your hand, you put the gel on, and you go straight to the hospital, straight to the hospital. Have someone drive you there. Um, I know a number of you all are not from America. Let me tell you something about America. One of the things that works really well in America is to say, if I'm not seen immediately, I will be suing you, okay? And you need to do this, all right? Because what happens with hydrofluoric, there will be someone sitting at the front desk who may not understand the severity of this. They may not get the fact that this can kill you, okay? And so if you go to an emergency room, you should be treated as if you had been shot with a gun, okay? Okay, so go into the emergency room, say, I believe I have a hydrofluoric acid burn. Do you understand what this means? And if they say, oh yeah, go have a seat, you say, no, no, I need to be seen immediately. And if I am not seen immediately, you're opening yourself up for a major lawsuit, okay? So that's the way America works. We have a good safety culture in this country, and it's all because of lawsuits, all right? So know this and use it. I'm being very, very serious because this stuff can kill you. If you get too much hydrofluoric acid, it will burn through your skin, it will get into your bones, it will go to your heart, it will cause you to have a heart attack and die. Okay? All right. But it makes really good silicon samples. Really good. Okay? Really good. So you may want to use it. All right. So that's just comments about safety. Um, nitric acid um, in ethanol, also explosive. Keep it cold. Get rid of it quickly. Dispose of it properly. Um, I had an incident where someone put nitric acid in glycerol because that was what the thing said to do. Okay? And that's fine if you keep it cold and you dispose of it properly. That person, this was when I was working at, a, at the Berkeley Labs, um, that person shouldn't have been in the room. They got in the room with a friend. Don't do that, okay? If you're, if you're having access to a room and a friend doesn't have access to that room, don't provide it, okay? Just don't, all right? Um, but someone brought someone into there. They mixed nitric with glycerin, um, nitroglycerin, right? That's a bomb. Um, and so they had a plastic bottle. They didn't know where the safety stuff was. They left it there, looked for a label, couldn't find it, took it to another room where there were seven other people in the room at the time, put it down, and it blew up. And fortunately, it blew up with the seam facing the wall, and nobody was hurt, okay? But you know, hot nitric acid everywhere is a bad thing. Again, with all of these things, no matter what chemical you use, be careful. It is your responsibility to be informed. Another thing, if you're ever in a situation where you see someone doing something that you know to be incorrect, stop them, all right? And if they say, oh, no, no, I know what I'm doing, say, no, you don't, okay? Find a supervisor. That's a department head. That's a faculty member. That's a staff member. And tell them, okay? If you're ever in a situation where something's being told to you that you need to do something dangerous, don't do it, okay? Don't do it. If you feel that you're in a bad position because of that, talk to your department head. 
Believe me, he will want to know. Talk to any faculty member at any point about your safety. They want to know and help you, okay? Okay. Me, find me. If you see something, find me. I'll take care of it, right? We just want to make people safe with all this stuff because it can be dangerous. <coughs> Other things, um, we use organic solvents a lot. A lot of things we do, we kind of glue things together to make samples. You need to be aware of the fact that these things need to be used in a fume hood because they're carcinogenic. In particular, um, Acetone and trichloroethane are very common, very commonly used, um, and you should use them in a fume hood because otherwise you're breathing stuff in you should not breathe. You need to dispose of things properly. You do not pour trichloroethane down the drain, okay? It's bad for the environment. You don't do it. There's proper ways to, to, to do these things. So for your lab, you should be aware of them. Also, you should always be aware of the fact that in, in our country, you have a responsibility to know the material safety data sheets. I know at Purdue, everyone gets indemnified on this, right? You have one lecture a year where you're told this. We'll now have two. Know that the material safety data sheets exist for every chemical in your lab. You're responsible to read them. Your supervisors are responsible to know the contents and make sure that everything's done safely, okay? And finally, there is listed here a website for the people at Purdue who take care of this, the REM people, you know, so you know it all. Okay? And again, if you're ever in a situation where something's happening that shouldn't happen, try to get it to stop. And if you don't, find a supervisor who can stop it. Okay? All right. I'm very serious about this. I've been involved with that one accident out of Berkeley that was thankfully not an accident. I've had a couple of hydrofluoric issues that, that again, thankfully nothing wrong. Um, but, you know, it's your life, so be careful. So that's my safety lecture for this class. Okay. All right. So, that said, sample preparation. Let's go on and, and talk about why we want to know all those safety issues. The idea with sample preparation is that you need to have your sample very, very thin. In the case of high resolution imaging, in the case of the best levels of spectroscopy, that's very, very thin. High resolution, about 100 angstroms is what is needed. If it's larger than 100 angstroms, you begin to introduce problems with image interpretation. The idea is that if it's very, very thin, you can assume though not always correctly, you can assume that you have a single scattering event in your sample that's giving you the image information. And based on that assumption, there are equations that we will discuss that lead to computer simulation programs that give you a better interpretability of the results that you see. So for high resolution, you're talking about 100 angstroms. How many atom columns is that in aluminum? I guess, is it 2, 10, 50, 100? 30, 50, right? Okay, depending on the orientation. So about 50 atom columns at most, all right? So that's pretty thin. And that puts real challenges on making samples because it's not easy to just say, oh, I'd like to have, you know, 50 atom columns right here, right? Uniform, flat, clean. So that's one of the, the, difference, the difficulties. For um, uh, scattering experiments, for doing spectroscopies, you can go a little bit thicker, but again, not too thick. Um, if you get too thick, you start to have multiple scattering, which causes problems with background and background subtraction. Um, for diffraction contrast work, thicker is better, actually. It's nice to have a little bit of dynamic scattering, but not too much. Um, there's, in fact, a proper amount of dynamic scattering that gives you nice image interpretability. Um, so you like to work in a slightly thicker area there. But again, you know, that's still pretty thin. So creating samples that are thin is the challenge. And it's very important for getting the right results out of your microscope. Um, the electron microscopy community generally um, talks about this a lot and recognizes this a lot. It's not uncommon to see uh, particular emphasis placed on in scientific talks about how samples were made, because it's important both in understanding the quality of someone's data and also just so we all share different ways of doing stuff. So don't be surprised if someone spends a couple slides at a, at a talk talking about TEM sample preparation because it's the way that we trade knowledge. Again, the limiting aspect of most microscopy experiments is not the microscope, but it's rather the sample and the quality of the sample preparation. So it's an important thing to get down. Now, I'm going to go through a couple of, of general ways of doing this. Um, and, and it's just an overview, and so if you, at a later point, need more information, um, we can talk about that specific to your application. Let me see where, where's a good point to stop uh, for the day. Let's go through and do one of these, and then I'll, I'll, I'll move on to the next ones last time. Let's say you've got a bulk of something. You've got a piece of, uh, I don't know, silicon germanium on silicon, and you want to look down 
uh, the growth direction. You want to look along the growth direction to say, look at the interface between the silicon germanium and the silicon, right? Um, one of the primary ways that we do this is we do what's what I would call grind dimple polish. So the idea is you take your bulk, um, you section it into relatively thin pieces so that you have something that's not too big, um, numbers of around a quarter of a millimeter or so. You create a three millimeter disc out of that in some way. The reason for three millimeters is that's the size of the sample holder. That's the universally agreed upon standard size for the TEM. Why three millimeters? Well, it's big enough to hold, but it's also small enough that if you want to tilt that within the pole gap of the microscope, you can get reasonable tilt. Okay, so that's just what was decided maybe 45 years ago to be the right number. Okay, so most things are three millimeter discs. You can do something like ultrasonic cutting. The idea there is that you have a little uh, rapidly vibrating uh, metal head and you put some silicon carbide powder there and you just kind of abrade away with a, a fast motion and form a little three millimeter disc. You can uh, core out this with basically a drill, a fine drill, again with a, a ceramic bit of some sort. And these are the two things that you can use to, to look at semiconductors or ceramics, things that are brittle. Um, you can also just cleave it. If you happen to have a good diamond scribe and you know the cleavage planes, you can make a square by cleaving to 2.8 by 2.8 and it'll fit, okay? So these are the first things to do is you make it small enough. The next thing you do is you now go through and grind this thing down physically um, to something like 100 microns. And so, you know, your multi-million dollar instrument, the starting process on this is usually, you know, a piece of sandpaper, okay? Which is kind of funny, right? But really, we start off with a piece of sandpaper, go 200 grit, 300 grit, 600 grit, 1200 grit, and grind down to a couple, you know, 100 microns or so. Usually, what we then do is use a specific tool called a dimpler. And I'll show a picture of that a little bit later. Um, the dimpler is just a specific small wheel that grinds uh, slowly, right? It, it rotates around. You put a little bit of powder underneath there in a slurry, and you then rotate your sample around. Uh, so that you form what looks like a golf ball dimple, right? So it's just a little trough within your sample. And you can do that controllably down to 10 to 20 microns or so. Um, and then the final step is usually using something called an ion mill. And the idea here is that you're going to go through and use accelerated argon ions to locally sputter away that thin region until you have a hole. And then you look around the hole Right? So if you've gone and you've poked a very small hole, then there's going to be a wedged region around that that is a little bit thicker and a little bit thicker and a little, and so that's the region you'll go through and look through. All right? And so the process is one of gradually thinning the sample down, first coarsely, uh, and then somewhat less coarsely with some good fine sandpaper, finally using um, diamond paste of say a micron or even less to dimple, and then using accelerated argon ions to impact on the sample and sputter away locally to create a little hole. Okay? If instead you want to look in cross section, say I've got that same silicon germanium film, and instead of looking down on top of it, I want to look along that interface. There this preparation method's a bit different. Usually what you do is you take two pieces of this stuff and you glue them together. Right, so that you have one face on the growth direction with another face on the growth direction, separated by a little layer of glue. We usually use something called either M-bond or G1, or sometimes this two-part Hardman epoxy. Okay? So it's just glue. Right? Again, multi-million dollar instrument. What do you start with? You know, some super glue uh, and a piece of sandpaper. All right? Then once these things are glued, you kind of follow the same procedure. You may use a diamond saw to section this thing into to 150 to 200 micron increments. Polish one side first with a, a sequence of fine sandpapers. You then mount it onto a support grid, usually something like a copper two millimeter grid. It's just a round grid with a hole in it. And so the region of interest, you put straight in the center of that thing. And then you go through and again, polish it down with something like 320 grit. 600 grit down to something like 20 microns, or if you want, you can use a dimpler at this step too. And the final thing is again, iron mill. But now you're looking in cross section, and so what you create is a hole right at the interface between these two things, and you can now look along that growth direction. I'll show you examples of all of these things um, in reality, as well as uh, some pictures next. So the, the viewpoint of this, right, if we have a couple of pieces of interest, let's pretend that the, the Ill, film of interest is this black layer, it's on another uh, support film and then a substrate. What you do is, again, put a couple of these things face-to-face -face with glue. 
you core out a three millimeter section, um, you can, if you want, put that inside of a tube that can help to hold everything together. You slice it into little increments, and then you go through and dimple and ion polish so that the electron beam is now coming <laughs> parallel to the interface between different things. And I'll show you again in the lab some of these samples so you see what they look like. And that lets you investigate the interface um, in high resolution or however you want um, so that you can look at growth mechanisms in that way. Um, the, the primary thing about this that's new, I mean, we all know what a piece of sandpaper is. Um, this dimpling machine, eh, you get the idea, right? It's just a little tool that helps you polish finely. But the iron mill is something that may be a, a, first, a first viewpoint for you. The idea here is that what we're going to do is basically use a controlled removal of atoms by sputtering. And so you go through and you have a plasma of argon created by dropping a very large, right, 6 kV voltage between an anode and cathode that's very short distance apart. That ionizes this argon gas, and then it's directed at the uh, sample itself. Argon's a reasonably heavy atom. If you're moving it with a 6 kV potential, it's moving pretty fast. And so it just goes through and knocks atoms off the surface and sputters them away. Um, you control the angle of incidence, you control the current, you control the voltage, and usually what you do is if you have, say, a 20 micron piece that came out of the dimpler, you go at it with a high voltage and a 14 to 16 degree angle and a reasonable current until you poke a hole. And then you turn all the voltage down, you might go to a lower angle, a lower current, and you do a more gentle removal of argon thereafter. And that helps to minimize the damage that might have been created by impacting these high energy argon ions into your sample in the first place. And so there's usually several steps of different ion milling sequences that you'll use to get the best sample. And again, what that can lead to, if you do it right and you've got a good sample preparation methodology, you can get regions that are even atomically flat over large areas with the right ion mill. Um, I've seen with some of the most advanced ion mills and really good people doing it, I've seen regions of samples that are you know, several hundred angstroms that are all the exact same number of atomic columns in size. And that's pretty impressive. Um, now, to do this sort of thing well is a skill. It's a bit of an art. It's a lot of it can be learned, but then it's mostly just about developing patience and experimental skill. Um, there are people who are very, very good at it. I have a, a colleague out at Berkeley that makes the best samples in the world, basically. There's another uh, two women at the Stuttgart lab that make incredible samples because that's what they do. And uh, just to, to share a story, uh, I was at a talk maybe two years ago now at the Materials Research Society meeting, and I saw a gentleman present some pictures, and they were absolutely gorgeous. Everything looked, uh, you know, the, the images were of equal intensity all the way across, you know, obviously the same number of atomic columns, perfect stuff. He was from Wright-Patterson Air Force Lab. And I said to him, I said, wow, you know, I mean, this is in a talk. I said, you know, who made your samples? These are great samples. What did you do? Because I wanted to know. And he said, oh, I had this fellow out of Berkeley do it, right? And it was really, you know, trying to give you a sense that if you're really that good at it, people will travel to you <laughs> to make the right sample because it takes a lot of skill and a lot of patience and some good, you know, development of how the equipment works to make the best samples. And I just thought that was really funny that I could, you know, could be in Boston at a talk and recognize the sample preparation quality as probably being from this guy at Berkeley that I knew. So it's kind of interesting, right? Well, what we were doing last time, right, is we were talking about uh, sample preparation and just overviewing some of the different routes for sample preparation with an awareness that um, we, we simply can't go through and, and, and describe in absurd detail all of them. But we talked a little bit last time about uh, how to prepare samples with some of the standard ways, the, uh, in particular the grind dimple polish methods of uh, creation of things like uh, semiconductor thin films and other brittle materials. This is a fairly standard technique. And again, just to get everyone back in the mode of it, I'll repeat that section of it today and then move on through the other standard sort of uh, types of techniques that we use, as well as uh, the use of the focused ion beam. There should be some extra handouts here for folks too. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so um, right, what we were doing was just kind of discussing different ways of making samples. Um, in particular, in the case of something like a semiconductor thin film or a brittle material, where what you want to do is look at um, the, the sample, say, along the growth direction of the film, looking down perpendicular to the growth plane. Um, this is a way that we uh, do this. It's called plan view preparation. 
And the idea is that really you're just trying to make sure that you thin the sample um, down to the level of electron transparency. Um, normally you start off by uh, thinning your sample down mechanically with something like sandpaper, right? And then you move on to create a three millimeter disc, the three millimeter disc being the required size to fit into the TEM sample holder in most cases. Some microscopes have 2.3 millimeter holders. Those are increasingly rare, but usually it's just a three millimeter holder. And then the idea with that is that you use either an ultrasonic cutter or simply a drill um, or a diamond scribe to allow you to create a sample of appropriate size that it fits into the holder. We then go through and grind this down again mechanically using sandpaper, increasingly fine grits of sandpaper down to about 100 microns or so from the back side, right? So that you leave the film of interest on the top surface uh, undisturbed. Then what we'll do is we'll mount that on a glass slide with a bit of a, of a wax and dimple using this machine called the dimpler. It's just a rotating wheel that you can use a fine paste slurry to get down to 10 to 20 microns, something quite thin mechanically. Um, the exact thickness that you choose depends on the sample. You also tend to have to vary the weight of the, of the arm that's putting the weight on top of the, of the sample with the dimpler just so that you get different uh, levels of, of performance and without breaking the sample because if you put too much weight, you go too thin and the thing can fracture. But then once you have the thing finally done, you place it in a machine called an iron mill and the iron mill uses argon ions to impact upon that and sputter the material away. Just to remind everyone, iron mills, the idea there is that you basically have a anode and a cathode, you flow in an argon uh, gas, you drop a large voltage across that gap, you arc a plasma, and then direct that plasma at your sample so that you have a high uh, voltage, thus accelerated uh, argon atoms, argon ions that are coming in and sputtering your sample away controllably. And what you do is you just rotate your sample around in a circle, you uh, put it at some angle of incidence and uh, choose a particular voltage and current. And what that does is locally thin the material right at the center. And that way you can remove down to the uh, angstrom scale um, and have a, have a sample that's down and thin at the angstrom scale. This is all done sequentially with, again, starting off at a higher angle and higher current density to just jam a hole all the way through your sample. And then you kind of go down from there at a lower angle and a lower current to do a more fine polish, leaving behind a thinned region around that hole that's appropriate for doing your uh, imaging thereafter. With uh, the case of cross sections, right, the idea is that you're going to take your sample of interest and now you want to look along that interface, that growth interface, and so you just take two sections of the material and glue them together and then you place them in a, in a usually what you'll do is you core out a section and, and sometimes you'll place them in a metal container just to hold things in place, but it follows the same methods of, of mechanically grinding down to 100 micron or so, dimpling and iron milling, and then the electron beam is allowed to travel parallel to that growth interface and let you look at the interface. And so in the case of semiconductor materials, both plan view and cross sections are used quite frequently, the cross section very frequently. Um, this is because usually when the case of semiconductor materials, what you're trying to do is look at sequential growths of different types of materials used in an electronic device. And so that cross-sectional view lets you get things like thickness and orientation of the different materials with respect to each other, okay? So this is a very common method. Um, now, those are the ones that you use for uh, ceramics, for semiconductors. In the case of metals, you can iron mill. You can follow similar methodologies for preparing samples using iron milling. Um, but another way to do this is to use a chemical method, and in particular, electrochemical method. The idea here is that you do basically a controlled corrosion of your sample. You put it inside of a, a, a bath that has an electrolyte that's going to um, preferentially attack your sample, and then you basically make uh, uh, your sample sit in between the positive and the negative of a uh, of, a, of, a, of a cell and you're going to jet the, the electrolyte in on your sample so that you have a controlled uh, ionized electrolyte that's coming in and corroding the sample locally. And usually what you do is you place this in a little container and you have this thing directed right at the center of your sample so it'll thin out the center and then there's usually a light detection unit so that the moment that you poke a hole it will see that light and then stop the voltage so that you don't etch any further. Usually with electropolishing, there are recipes for all sorts of different samples. If you ever need uh, to find the right electropolish for your sample, a good place to go, there's a book by J.W. Eddington, and in volume five, he just lists all sorts of electrolyte polishes. If you ever need that, let me know. I have a copy. 
and you can just go through and find some particular chemical uh, combination that works well or is, is believed to work well. And then you go through and follow the methods. There's, there's a particular ratio of chemistry. Usually temperature as well is something that you control. Often things are done down cold. And then you establish a voltage current relationship so that you have a particular, uh, so, so the idea, and I'll have to draw on the board here, but the idea is if you plot the, the measured current versus the applied voltage, usually these things will have a sharp rise, and then there will be a plateau, and then another sharp rise. And so it looks kind of like a diode uh, curve. And the idea is that if you operate this at just the right voltage and current, you'll be in this plateau regime, and you'll get very nice thinning at a very constant rate. And so that's something that you uh, basically go through in the process and establish this IV curve for your system. And then once you know it, you set the voltage at the appropriate place and get good etching from there. And the idea is that you end up just creating a very thin region um, and then a hole. And right the moment that hole is created, you stop the current, you stop the voltage, and you uh, find that, again, around the hole, the, the sample is usually thin enough to image through. This works very well once you get used to uh, making samples with electropolishing. For your particular system, you can uh, really prepare quite a number at a time, and so that's very nice. It's usually fairly tedious to set the thing up, so it's not uncommon for people to have a number of different sample you know, systems that they want to look at, you know, different processing methods they've been considering, and then just run through and make a whole bunch at once. But you can tend to make four or five different samples of each one um, pretty quickly, a couple hours worth of work once you get things set up. So it's very nice and, and makes very good samples. There's another variant that you can use to prepare semiconductor materials. Basically there, the idea is you just skip the, uh, the idea of having an electrochemical method. Um, you instead just rely on a chemical etching. In the case of something like silicon, you use hydrofluoric nitric acetic. In the case of gallium arsenide, you use methanol and bromine. And there's other uh, types of etchants that are known. And these things are really quite nice. Um, the idea is, again, you just basically create a, a little bath of the etching solution. And it preferentially attacks the, the, a region that you open up to that uh, to, that, to the presence of those chemicals, you poke a little hole, and again, look around the hole. And so again, if you are someone who is doing this sort of thing, uh, then you have to be pretty careful with the chemicals, because they tend to be fairly uh, nasty ones, but you can make very good samples this way. And in particular, in the case of silicon and silicon germanium, you can make excellent samples through the use of hydrofluoric nitric acetic, which is a really great way to make lots and lots of samples. So. It's uh, just something you have to work through. Um, again, if anyone's doing any of these sorts of things with respect to electropolishing here at Purdue, there's a number of people that are quite good at it. I'll direct you to the right people. If anyone's doing something in the semiconductor area of this type, I'll direct you to me and I can help you out because I've done quite a bit of this myself. Um, and it's just a matter of developing the right experimental approaches and, and feel for how these things work. <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of other types of sample preparation that people use. Um, and, and have applications to different types of materials. Very popular at Purdue is the tripod polishing method. Um, that's largely because Alex King, who was here you know, just a couple months ago before he moved off to Ames Lab, um, one of his graduate students uh, invented one of the tripod polishers. So as a result, he tended to perpetuate that and was very uh, familiar with that technique. The idea there is that instead of using the dimpler to go to the final thinning, you use a polishing wheel that has three legs to it. And then you can just adjust the angle on those things so that you preferentially move away and remove one side of the thing and create a very thin wedge, even down to the point of being electron transparent. But usually people will go down and thin that thing down very, very thin and then do a final eye milling polish just to clean it up. So again, tripod polishing, uh, if you get good at it, you can make very nice samples that way. I've personally always found it very tedious, but there are a number of people here who are good at it. So if that works for you, I can point you to some good people in that area. One of the, the reasons that I think the TEM is seeing increasing interest uh, is because there's lots of people who are looking at nano stuff that find that the TEM provides the, the highest level of, of imaging magnification that they need to get good uh, feedback on their preparation process. And in particular, in the areas of nanotube, nanowire, nanoparticle synthesis, um, the TEM is a great tool. Um, the thing that's also nice about it is the preparation of samples for these sorts of materials is very, very simple. And so there's a, a real uh, nice synergy between nanotechnology and uh, the TEM usage in general. The idea if you have, say, uh, a silicon nanowire and you want to measure the diameter of the thing, basically you can take these things and disperse them in something as simple as methanol or, or some other uh, alcohol, sonicate the thing up a little bit, 
and then drop that on top of a pre-ordered, you know, you just buy a, a, a mesh grid that has a carbon thin film on it and then you evaporate the ethanol away and voila, the, the residual stuff that falls down at the bottom of that drop is the material you're interested in and you're good to go. It's about as easy as can be. And so that's a, a very nice thing. So if you just want to get you know, images of your particle size or your nanowire diameter, et cetera, the creation of TEM samples is very, very easy with that. Um, and again, I can direct you to people or help you do that if that's your area. And I know it is for a number of people in the crowd here. Um, if, if for some reason you want to look at an interface between the growth of, say, a nanowire and a substrate, then it gets much harder. Um, you have to go through and think about ways of, of embedding these things in a glue or something that will hold them while you go through and do the same sectioning and grinding and dimpling and iron milling that you need to do for the other types of techniques, but you can do it. Um, another way that works to make samples, if you're fortunate enough, if you have a very brittle sample, um, you can actually just go through and cleave the sample and look at the cleaved edge. And if, that, if you do that and you uh, develop some good technique with that, the cleaved edge of these things will tend to be uh, atomically uh, th you know, thinned down to the, to the level of doing atomistic level of imaging, a couple hundred angstroms or less. And so this can work very well if you're fortunate enough to have the right sample. Now another thing that people uh, do is uh, there's a thing called replica technique. This is less common these days, but people are, are, are still, you know, I, I still get the occasional request on this one. If you're interested in looking at, say, a fracture surface, what you can do is take your fracture surface and coat the thing with a carbon and then shadow a uh, heavy metal on top of it like gold from an angle via evaporation and then pull that carbon off and then you image that. And what it lets you do is get a picture of the uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the roughness on the top of that fracture surface down to very uh, high levels of resolution. So that can be a, a handy way to do things if that's something you need. But that's starting to be replaced more and more just with taking a good SEM image. But I still get the occasional request for people um, on how to do that. So those are kind of some of the other less, uh, you know, less complicated ones to some extent. And uh, the nanoparticle, nanowire one, it's really that simple. You go ahead and you buy yourself a, a carbon grid on top of a, a, you know, copper mesh support and just drop a little dollop of ethanol down on top of your sample and dry it off and there you go. So that's a, a very handy thing. Now there's a, a final thing I want to talk about with sample preparation which is the use of the focused IMB microscope. This is something that's only been in place for about now 10 years or so. Um, this is uh, a, a picture of one of these things. You're going to learn about SEM in MSC 581 if you take it. Um, the focused ion beam operates in a very similar fashion to an SEM. But instead of using uh, electrons for doing imaging, it uses ions. It uses, in particular, gallium ions. And the idea is that you have what's called a liquid metal ion source. It's basically a little uh, post that you have a charge of solid gallium in a, on a wire mesh basket on top of that little thin post. And you melt the gallium through the application of a little bit of current. And you get a drop of liquid right on the tip of that little post. And that will tend to stay liquid. And what you do is you then immerse that into a high field and you can suck off the gallium um, using uh, the field to extract the gallium ions. And then you use electrostatic optics instead of magnetic optics and it works just like an SEM. You use electrostatic optics to form lenses to scan the beam back and forth. Now the reason to do this is that the gallium ions are uh, reasonably heavy and so as they come into your sample they will impact the sample. They will create secondary electrons so that you can image just like you can in the SEM, they'll create secondary ions. You can image those too with a detector set up the right way. But also, you can locally sputter. And so the idea with the focused ion beam for TM sample preparation is it allows you to go through and locally remove material and leave behind thin sections that you can later extract um, and use for a TM samples. And so the idea is that you can go through and start off with a reasonably high current, something like 20 nanoamps is the maximum on most machines, um, which is a pretty high amount of current. And you just blow away lots of material. And then you sequentially go down to lower and lower levels of current and thin the thing down to make a nice thin section. I'll show you a number of pictures of this in a second. It'll make it a bit more clear. The FIB is a very useful tool for doing site-specific preparation. If you have a particular thing that you've been creating, Say, uh, this is used a lot in the semiconductor industry for site-specific preparation of failed parts of a circuit. You can go in and say, this is the region I want to make a TEM sample from and locally prepare a sample there. Also, if you have uh, difficult materials, things that are, are some, some layering that has both hard and soft materials, 
Um, something that's just not working well in, in any of the other techniques, usually the fib is something worth trying to try to, to, to see if this works for you as well. And also, if you have materials with very different uh, relative milling rates, so if you have something that uh, has, a, has a harder film on a softer substrate, it gets difficult to make cross sections because what will happen is during the case of normal argon ion milling, you'll remove, say, the softer substrate, and you'll have a hard time finding a thin, equally thin region between the interfaces of the film and the substrate to look at. So this is a very good tool for that as well. And the way that this works, this is just taken from uh, uh, an older book on, now it's now a couple years old, on focused ion beam microscopy. And the idea here is, let's say you've got some region of the sample that you want to look at in particular. From some other methodology, you found out that this device in particular is bad. What you do is you just take a, say, 100 micron or preferably 50 micron thick section of this that you've ground down. And you can go through and carve away a trench on either side of the region of interest. And then gradually thin this thing down to electron transparency. And then what you do is invert this thing so that it's 90 degrees. Um, from the focused ion beam direction, and you shoot the electrons from the TEM down the channel, right? So this thing sits upright, and then you can look down through that channel to do your imaging. Um, this is called the H-bar method. This was the first type of method that was developed for this sort of thing. And it works pretty well for uh, lots of different materials. Um, it's pretty straightforward to do. One of the issues with this H-bar method is that you do have this trench, and so you can do limited tilting. Um, you tend to get some shadowing of that region. Um, so if you want to do extensive tilting for dislocation imaging or the like, this may not be the approach for you. Additionally, if you're trying to do energy dispersive spectroscopy, you have lots of possibilities of having secondary scatter, which can make quantitation difficult. So that's another uh, issue with that. Okay? Um, I'll show you an example of, of this kind of H-bar method. Uh, sort of a modified H-bar method. This is just some from research that I've done with some other folks. This is uh, a sample that's used to characterize fatigue of silicon. This is some work with Chris Muelstein at Penn State and Rob Ritchie at Berkeley. And the idea is that this little machine is just used. You uh, resonate this thing back and forth through the application of a voltage at point B here, um, a sinusoidal voltage. This thing moves into resonance and causes this thing to undergo stress, okay? Um, both tensile and compressive, you measure it over here. But the idea is if you're interested in looking at this region, you'll notice that it's quite small, right? And so if you want to have a sample made from just that particular region, it can be difficult using standard types of methods. What you're seeing is you're seeing what, two of these little resonators, and we're going to go through and show images as we go through and thin this thing down. Basically, you can go through and use the ion beam to you know, sequentially section away portions of this thing. You flip the thing over. You do it again from the other side. And then if you look at this uh, along the top, as you've gone through and done this, you've gone through and made the sample quite thin in the end, this distance here only being a couple hundred nanometers, and again, um, OK for doing TEM. This distance on the left-hand side was 2 microns. That's way too thick to image through. But if you get down to a couple hundred nanometers, you can take very nice images. And if you look at the next section, this is actually a, a bright field TEM image from that same region of an unfailed device and you can see that you get very nice uh, image quality in a thin TM sample from doing this method. So it's, it's a way to do local uh, site-specific preparation uh, of, your, of your samples. Okay. Okay. Um, another thing that's nice about this is that you can do another method called the in-situ lift-out method. Um, here the idea is, let's say you've got some little features that you want to look at. In this case, uh, it's little laser-induced um, damage pits in lithium niobate. This was some work done with A.J. Malshay at Arkansas. And the idea here was that we wanted to go through and find out what was the nature of the damage caused by this laser. And so you've got rather, you know, rather small little holes. And what you can do is you can come in and section away on either side of those holes. And this is the region that has been impacted. And then what we do is we go through and use a little microscale robot. It's just a, literally uh, a nano positioning system with a sharp tip you bring the sharp tip down and you grab hold of this thing and then pull it out and mount it onto a TEM sample grid. And then you can go through and do subsequent thinning. And here's an SEM image of that same area and then a TEM image of the same area. So it lets you go through and prepare very nice site-specific images from particular regions. So I think that's kind of cool because you can see that if you want to look at the damage that occurred underneath this, the SEM will give you very much less information than something like the TEM. And from the TEM, you can see amorphization, dislocation, formation, and the like. And all by pulling that little thing out and then examining it in situ in the TEM. 
So the FIB is something that is increasingly used. Um, they're used routinely in the semiconductor industry. Many university labs now have one. Um, all the national labs have one. And so as you think about doing sample preparation, this may be the thing you want to do. It's a bit more time consuming and a bit more uh, work than some of the other methods. So it's not something to do first. But it can work well for different types of, of systems. So the goal I had with that was just to, again, overview the different types of sample preparation and tell everyone that, you know, as you go through with your own work, you'll want to talk to colleagues that have done the types of samples you've done. Um, you'll be able to rely on me to point you to people to help you with things like the electropolishing systems or the dimplers or whatever. And again, if you need my time, I'm happy to help prepare samples uh, and show you how to prepare samples. Uh, but again, the issue with this class is we just don't have you know, show and tell on all that because it just gets to be a bit too tedious for everyone. Um, so with that, that's kind of the end of that section of the, of the lectures on the sample preparation. Anything else on that? Any questions? No. Okay. It's, it's hard to get you know, too excited about sample preparation, but you've got to know something about it and the different methods that are out there.